Good evening. <laughs> Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about why we should slow down the Earth's rotation and how we can bring it about. As some of you might... Oh, before I begin, I do just have to let you know that my views aren't endorsed or supported in any way by the university. <laughs> now, some of you might be aware that this has the consequences of the Earth ceasing to rotate have been discussed previously, such as by Randall Munro in What If, or National Geographic's Aftermath documentary. Um, <laughs> however, these studies have been flawed for two reasons. The first is that they haven't offered any mechanism by which we could actually achieve this state. And the second is that they focused, perhaps inordinately, on the downsides that would accompany it. <laughs> which include the extreme temperatures on the opposite side of the planet due to the extended day-night cycle, the storms of frankly ridiculous magnitude between the two sides because of the temperature difference, and also possibly the loss of the Earth's magnetic field, which would expose us to the solar wind. <laughs> Not to accuse them of sensationalism, <laughs> but I feel these sources have clearly neglected to consider the various advantages this could bring about. So, um, why should we stop the Earth's rotation? Well, one reason is that we get a centrifugal force. This means the planet bulges out of the equator, like a, like a pizza being spun. And this is surprisingly inconvenient. It means the weight is different depending on where you are on a planet's surface. And also, the Earth becomes not a perfect sphere, as we would like it to be. <laughs> but instead an oblate steroid. <laughs> so, if we were to slow down the Earth's rotation, that would be ideal for science, or for physics at least, um, <laughs> with a constant gravitational field across the planet's surface, you, physics experiments could be so much more consistent in their conditions. While a spherical planet would make modeling the Earth much easier, and also simplify GPS and mapping. <laughs> Admittedly, those maps would have to be redrawn, as the changing surface of a planet would also affect the distribution of the oceans, which would flood everywhere above and below the equator. <laughs> really, that's a small price to pay. <laughs> Another consequence of the Earth's rotation is the Coriolis force. This is a subtle deflection of moving objects in a rotating reference frame, and it's in everyday life, it's far too small for us to notice. However, it is responsible for hurricane formation. These kill tens of thousands of people every year. Even worse, it can cause errors in particle physics experiments. <laughs> so this is clearly something we need to get rid of as soon as possible. And the simplest and easiest way of going about this is just slowing down the Earth. Um, that way, with one fewer source of error to consider, physics can advance that little bit faster for the rest of human existence however long that might be. <laughs> and we'd also eradicate hurricanes, but I'm not quite sure how it um, plays into the other side effects. And one last reason to slow down the Earth's rotation is that it means, um, is that our current rotation means that we have far too many different definitions for what a day is. And all of these are flawed. We have to use leap years, leap seconds, and daylight saving time to compensate. So if we slow it down to something much easier to work with, we can make things a lot easier for ourselves. <laughs> As you can see, we've got two main options. The, the first, called tidal locking, is where we have one rotation every year. That means the sun never rises or sets, and days become obsolete. We can just define things in terms of fractions of the year, which is a lot simpler. <laughs> The other possibility is to get rid of all the rotation entirely, in which case a day becomes identical to a year, and the sun rises or sets not because of our rotation, but because of our orbit around the sun. So both of these would be a lot more logical, and <laughs> without daylight saving time, they'd, we'd save millions every year in opportunity costs, <laughs> and there'd be no risk of forgetting to put your alarm forward and going to lectures late. <laughs> so how can we achieve this? <laughs>
Well, one reason to support this laudable goal is that it is happening already. <laughs> because of this tidal locking process, which is a sort of gravitational friction. And the only downside to this method is how long it takes, as the Earth is probably going to be swallowed up by the sun in its red giant phase, long before we see any meaningful improvements. <laughs> so this is too slow for our methods. If we take a proactive approach, we can do a whole lot better. One means of doing so is with the creation of space elevators. By creating these, we change the planet's moment of inertia, like, and like a ballet dancer extending their arms during a spin, we cause the planet's rotation to slow down. We can get even greater improvements by launching the masses off the ends at high speeds, but unfortunately I don't know any ballet moves that could demonstrate that possibility for you. <laughs> The main obstacle with this approach is that it relies on the space elevator cables being possible to create. Um, so we really need those materials engineers to finally get their act together. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we could be having this conference on Mars by now. <laughs> so this is clearly unfeasible because they just need, can't finish it in time. So instead, we need another method. One option is rotating objects on the Earth's surface. These can take away some of the planet's angular momentum and that slows it down. Unfortunately, the effect is very small. And, <laughs> and the only way we'd see any meaningful improvements would be if we did something ridiculous, like spun up the space elevators and attach them to the poles, <laughs> which is too, practical, too impractical even by my standards. So, and also it relies on elevator cables being possible to create. So, Instead, the most practical option is to bombard the planet with asteroids. <laughs> it might... Um, please bear with me. Um, <laughs> you see, an asteroid landing at the equator with a really shallow angle of impact can transfer almost all of its kinetic energy to cancelling the Earth's rotation. And according to my estimates, this is a quite efficient method. We don't need to use one fifth of the asteroid belt to accomplish this. <laughs> Another advantage to this method is that it's achievable with current technology. NASA's already planning to retrieve a single 500 ton asteroid, and from their cost estimates, we can extrapolate how much this would cost, which is approximately 10 sextillion pounds. <laughs> That's 22 zeros. Um, however, there is still hope um, for a project that is not for anyone living on the planet. <laughs> you see, um, these asteroids have to land somewhere. As long as it's along the equator, we don't really care. So there's a couple of ways we can monetize this. <laughs> the first is that the asteroids would deposit a lot of rare earth metals which would make a lucrative mining opportunity for any, anyone who didn't have the misfortune to be killed by the impact. <laughs> and national governments are probably going to be quite keen to have a say in where these asteroids land. <laughs> so we could let them bid on it. <laughs> if you want to be more pragmatic, you could just extort the governments directly instead. Um, that way they pay for the project and in exchange, we don't become immediate victims of it. <laughs> so it's clear we've got a reason why we should do this. We have a means of carrying it out. And now the only question which remains is whether we stop at tidal locking, that's one rotation per year, or get rid of all spin entirely. And this part is ultimately a debate between ideals and practicality. You see, the, if we get rid of all of our spin entirely, there would be no inertial forces to consider, no Coriolis force or centrifugal force at all, which is perfect. <laughs> uh, for high precision physics experiments, at least. <laughs> However, to maintain this state against the pull of various celestial objects, it would require regular asteroid impacts, <laughs> which might negate the advantages for the highly sensitive experiments you'd want to carry out. <laughs> And tidal locking, where one side of a planet faces the sun at all times, has its own perks. 
This is as uh, the side facing the sun at all times would be perfect, carpeted in solar panels, while the reversed is ideal for astronomy. <laughs> Those highly expensive telescopes would not become utterly useless during the day, and once the atmosphere starts to condense out and get blasted off into space by the solar wind, you wouldn't even ha have any of that annoying air getting in the way of observations. <laughs> so, to conclude, I think it's obvious that removing the Earth's rotation would be of great benefit to science, or at least physics, the only one which matters, um, as we'd have no inertial forces to consider. Uh, fewer, that means fewer sources of error, and we can consider the Earth as a uniform sphere, which is what physicists love to do. <laughs> so physics could advance that a little bit faster for the rest of human existence. There'd also be fringe benefits, but these might be outweighed by the minor disadvantages, which I think we can sum up most succinctly by saying that everywhere on the planet is becoming un uninhabitable some way or another. <laughs> but I don't think we should let that hold us back from making the Earth a much more hospitable place, if not for us, then for physics. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs> and And I hope you'll be willing to provide me the support in helping my project achieve the funding it deserves. <laughs> because remember, as soon as we can deal with a single asteroid, we can extort all the rest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a flawless argument from Louis Carroll.